This March, the FDA approved the first new chemical mechanism for fighting depression in decades. It's a nasal spray of ketamine, most commonly known for its use as a tranquilizer. How do drugs like these affect the brain, and what's new about this one? Let's start from the bottom. We think the activity of neurons in your brain produce your experiences and behaviors. While these cells are famously electrical, the connections between them are chemical. Where neurons connect with others, they let out little bursts of chemicals which can encourage or prevent the next neuron from becoming active. Any chemical that's used in this way is called a neurotransmitter. The most common neurotransmitters in the brain are glutamate and GABA, which are both present in around half of all neural connections. Glutamate is excitatory, it tends to cause neurons to fire more, and GABA is inhibitory, it tends to shut them off. You may also have heard of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, the stuff in EpiPens. These are some of the most common neurotransmitters known to affect behavior in the brain. We've actually discovered over 200 neurotransmitters, which are used by a whole zoo of different neuron types. Drugs that affect the brain are often found to imitate, bolster, or suppress natural neurotransmitters. A lot of what we know about the behavioral roles of neurotransmitters comes from seeing the effects of psychoactive drugs that interact with them. This is the case for depression as well. We still don't know for sure what depression is at the neural level, because it presents in so many different ways for different people. Right now, like most psychological disorders, we're still working backwards from what we can observe behaviorally. For example, we know depression is marked by symptoms such as low mood, fatigue, mental fog, and suicidal thoughts. In the 1960s, scientists noticed that some drugs which changed serotonin levels in the brain had mood-related side effects. Those that lowered serotonin tended to cause depressive symptoms, while those that raised it tended to alleviate them. This led to the serotonin hypothesis, the idea that depression was related to a decrease in serotonin. SSRIs, or Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, were developed to treat depression by increasing serotonin activity. Unfortunately, low serotonin isn't the whole story for depression. Many other neurotransmitters are also altered in patients with depression, and just raising serotonin levels alone isn't always enough. Around a third of patients with depression don't seem to respond to SSRIs. Enter ketamine. Ketamine interferes with glutamate signaling. Remember that glutamate is the major neurotransmitter that makes neurons more active, and it's in around half of all the connections in your brain. As you can imagine, interfering with it has some pretty wide-ranging effects. At high doses, ketamine effectively disconnects higher and lower brain areas, cutting people off from the outside world, making it impossible to see, hear, feel pain, or even produce memories. This is great for patients undergoing surgeries or other medical interventions, especially because it preserves heart and lung function, unlike most sedatives. Ketamine was approved for medical use in the U.S. in 1970 and saw a heavy application in surgeries following the Vietnam War. Low doses of ketamine were first found to affect depression in the late 90s. Antidepressant effects were seen within hours of taking the drug, and could last for weeks. This was very different from SSRIs, which for some reason can take months to reach full effect, and wear off quickly when you stop taking them. Research is still just beginning, but ketamine seems to do more than temporarily affect glutamate signaling. It somehow causes the brain to produce more chemicals that are basically neural fertilizers, helping neurons to grow new connections. When combined with other treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy, this could allow some patients to rapidly develop new pathways that help them to better regulate their emotions. Studies have shown that more than half of patients respond to ketamine, even when SSRIs don't work. Due to its immediate and lasting action, ketamine is poised to become an invaluable tool for treating depression. Of course, it's important to be cautious. This is a very new treatment. We've only observed patients for up to a year after receiving it. Ketamine can also cause hallucinations, and has the potential for addiction and abuse. As a result, the FDA has only approved it for patients with moderate to severe depression who have not responded to at least two other medications. Despite these limitations, ketamine holds a lot of promise. It represents an entirely new way of treating depression by interacting with glutamate. As research continues, it may lead us to a whole new family of drugs and a deeper understanding of the neurochemistry of depression. Thanks for watching, and stay curious.